I really want to thank Vander Lee. This has been an amazing meeting. Thanks. This has been an amazing meeting, and uh, I've learned a lot. I can't wait to have the debrief with my group, uh, w with all of the, the, the written stuff. I think there's going to be a lot to talk about over the Christmas break, and I'm looking forward to it. I want to bring us back to quantum mechanics and uh, something that hasn't really been discussed that much, and that is that it's a first that Schrodinger's equation, which is not quite 100 years old yet, but is the thing that I think about the most in quantum mechanics is a first order differential equation in time. And uh, there, that means that there aren't any static solutions. There are stationary solutions. Uh, and uh, a lot of what we do is built on those stationary solutions. So here's a simple example of cesium atom with some Rydberg states and a couple of of radio wave functions that are the stationary state for the cesium atom. Uh, and uh, by themselves, uh, they don't seem to evolve in time except for a global phase, which is slightly different for the two. And uh, as a result, if you can somehow excite both of them at the same time in a superposition, there will be charge evolution in the atom. I'm not telling anybody here anything that they didn't know, but I think I am saying something that hasn't really been talked about or thought about that much in this in 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 this meeting, and and uh, my interest is in studying that in atoms and molecules, not just in Rydberg states, but in the ground state. So let me just uh, again say something that this is maybe now familiar to slightly fewer than everybody in this room, but nonetheless, uh, just point out that there's very, very standard technology, very old technology now, for doing that simultaneous preparation uh, optically from uh, any pure ground state of a system. We can uh, excite it with uh, a, uh, a laser that has two colors at the same time, and if the phases are locked together, uh, then the phases of the excited state will also be locked together, and all we need is a convenient, simple technology to do that, and we have one. And that technology is ultra-fast lasers. I won't spend any time telling you how they work other than they are lasers that simultaneously produce lots of colors, all with very definite phase relationships. And uh, the way they, they do that is by finding ways to favor the production of a very short pulse in the cavity. Short pulse then has in its Fourier transform gives its spectrum, has, has uh, all of these colors locked in phase. Uh, of course, uh, that means that they're bouncing back and forth in the cavity and coming out in a regular stream with an extremely precise separation between the pulses um, and uh, very much identical pulses one to the other. And that process is well known to this community because that's been used for metrology that makes some of our best clocks that gave a Nobel Prize to uh, to Ted and Jan, uh, you know, 15 years ago. But we use this too. Um, we use this to excite these multiple states. So here's a really simple example again. Uh, simp the same laser that Ted Hench uses, I could capture one of those pulses, send it into a cesium cell, and make uh, an excited superposition state in cesium that then would evolve, and uh, I could read it out. Now, how do I read it out? That's actually also very simple. It's all done with mirrors. It's a great thing about being a laser jock. Uh, we simply uh, use a set of mirrors to create a Mach standard or Michelson interferometer so that we have now two replicas of that same laser pulse and use the second one to, to read out the first one. Okay. And uh, here's an example of some data that was published uh, about uh, 24 years ago. Uh, showing uh, simultaneous production of eight Rydberg states in cesium, same atom we're talking about. The color here is the quantum phase of each uh, of each position in the and the non-stationary uh, eigenfunction that's evolving. You can see if the phase gradient is low, color gradient is slow. That means that the that the uh, momentum at that position is small. If it's very fast. It means things are moving fast at that part of the molecule. This is what one of those, you know, Bohr elliptical orbits actually actually looks like. And you could say this is a kind of a movie of a quantum mechanical 
phenomenon. Uh, and this is all going on now. I didn't put the time scale in here. These time scales are on the order of hundreds of femtoseconds to, to picoseconds. Okay, a more uh, interesting case would be to add a few degrees of freedom and go to a molecule. And uh, well, we can do that too. We can excite a molecule with the same kind of, kind of excitation. If we do this in the Born-Oppenheimer picture that I'm showing here, uh, the uh, distance between atoms in a diatomic molecule uh, is uh, along the x-axis here, and the energy scale of the different energy eigenvalues now depend on that distance, and that makes these potential wells. Those potential wells are potential wells for quantum mechanical objects, so if you do photo excitation with a green laser, you'll make an oscillating vibrational wave packet, again, something that's pretty well known to us atomic physicists, and we'd like to image something like that too, and we can do that as well. Here's an example where we excite uh, a diatomic molecule, in this case iodine, but now instead of reading it out with the same uh, replica of the pulse, we'll read it out with an X-ray pulse. I have to, to do this, I need to have an X-ray laser that has similar time structures, but the same kind of pump probe experiment, and now I'll just look at X-ray scattering and see how that changes as a function of time. And it changes very dramatically as a function of time because mostly what an X-ray laser uh, sees when it scatters from two atoms vibrating is it sees the atoms getting closer together and farther apart. And that creates diffraction that moves and you can it's the most dominant thing that you see in a picture like that. And you can use that to make what you might call a molecular film strip, not really a movie, but it could be a movie if I wanted to display it that way. On the, on the left, it actually shows the scattering. Uh, uh, the, sc the scattering is a function of angle away from the axis of scattering versus time delay. Scattering on the x-axis, time delay on the, vert on the vertical axis, and then that transforms simply by a cosine transform into the actual distance between the iodine atoms as a function of time. You can see them vibrating. You can also see that with a smaller probability, uh, you get some, some, uh, some uh, dissociation. OK, how do we make that x-ray laser? Well, it's no, no big trick if you have some very smart people around 10 or 20 years and a billion dollars. Uh, and I would have thought a billion dollars would have been a stopper when this started, but now I'm at this meeting where people throw these numbers around like nothing. So, hey, you guys want one of these? Hey, just go get one. Um, this one it, this one happens to be kind of long. It's a few kilometers long. It's, uh, it, it's sort of a, a three quarters of a mile away from my house. So I, I walk here in the morning uh, uh, there at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Um, this is what uh, the center picture in the top there shows uh, actually what it looks like if you get close to it. And uh, now this picture shows what's going on. Very, very bright electrons are going back and forth in, magne in a mag magnetic undulators. And they radiate as they do so. And of course, because they're so relativistic, they go the speed of light, and so does the light. But they don't go in a straight line. They wiggle. So, if they, so they fall behind the light that they produce by one cycle per cycle. And that's the wavelength. That slippage is the wavelength of the light you produce. That's what makes it a laser. You, get, you start getting stimulated emission because of the back action of the light that you produce on these uh, electrons. Um, here's uh, a, a, a simulation of a bunch of electrons. Uh, and you can see the bunching effect. And they're getting more and more bunched as some get ahead and some fall behind. And, then, at the very end, it seems to smear out. That's because this is an efficient laser. That last little cycle took so much energy away that the electrons went to lower energy and got longer orbits and just fell out of sync. So this is a real game switch phenomenon. Produces very sharp sub femtosecond spike and is only about 10 billion or so times brighter than the second brightest source of x-rays that uh, physicists can work with at machines. So it's a very bright source. OK, so that's how we do 
femtosecond or picosecond X-ray movies or molecular movies is fairly straightforward. However, it's not good enough. Uh, and uh, you can look at, uh, I just, I could describe this in a number of ways, but I really like some of the comments that came out of people who gave talks in, in uh, Stockholm after they won the Nobel Prize. Manfred Eigen won a Nobel Prize for uh, learning how to look at fast chemical reactions and pointed out that the really good stuff to look at was immeasurably fast in 1967. More than 30 years later, Ahmed Zouel won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for ultrafast chemistry. And it's st we still hadn't done this. We still hadn't solved this problem of mapping these out. He pointed out how great it would be to be able to do it. Um, and uh, why? Why do we have to even get faster? It's because of some of the things that have been talked about at this meeting briefly, because electrons move fast and they couple to nuclei. And if you really want to see how chemistry works, you have to capture that motion. Now, the, the time it takes for an average electron in an average molecule to move across the molecule is about a quarter of a femtosecond. Um, and uh, it, here's a calculation that shows uh, what uh, one of those electrons moving back and forth in a molecule following its photo excitation would look like. Uh, and uh, the problem is that this calculation, even though it maps out lots of sub femtosecond motion, isn't, isn't really a very good calculation. And the reason is because uh, it was assuming that the atoms never move. But of course, that's not true. The atoms do move. And so these calculations are very difficult. And this is, I think, has been pointed out a few times, one of the challenges. Coupled electron nuclear motion beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation is beyond current calculational capabilities in all but rather simple cases. And direct measurements are therefore critical. So we would like to get down to the out of second scale. Now, this has been done. And I'll tell, give you a little bit of an of a intro into how, that, how it's done. Okay? Um, this all started with the need for stronger, shorter later pul laser pulses that were stronger than uh, the laser could stand. That is, uh, what happens when you try to amplify laser pulses that starts destroying the laser medium. And to solve this problem, you need to, a number of tricks. One of them is very highly celebrated right now because it led to a Nobel Prize in 2018 for, for Donna Strickland and Gerard Maru. And uh, that's uh, a trick that we use, and in fact, that, that they devised so that they could solve this problem, the problem of electrons tunneling from fields that were strong enough so that the bound electron can no longer remain bound. A, a new way of photoionizing, not absorbing a photon, stripping the electron away with the strength of the field. This can be very readily done with pulsed lasers using the methods that Strickland and Maru invented. And let me show you what it looks like now. It's a very standard technology in our game now. If you, this is a hydrogen atom on the lower left. It's wave function, 1s wave function, getting distorted by a strong laser field. And I show a little schematic of the distortion in the upper left there. You can see that the electron, some of the, of the probability amplitude leaves and then gets driven back towards the, uh, the, the uh, atom again. And, then all kinds of interesting weird stuff happens. Uh, we can look at that weird stuff by simply capturing the electrons that ionize. And this is the pattern. This is a momentum distribution pattern, uh, uh, momentum uh, 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 extending away from the center of this pattern is, is uh, the momentum of the electrons receive having been tunnel ionized. And, all of that beautiful stuff that you see there, that the rings and the spider pattern and all that, that's all real. It's all absolutely real. It's quantum interference of one electron with itself because of the ambiguity about the tunneling. When did it tunnel? What part of the cycle? Did it uh, tunnel on successive cycles? Uh, you, you know, a simple, a, a simple example are these concentric rings, which are actually even in energy space because they correspond to electrons that ionize on successive cycles. All of this is completely coherent and, and uh, 
I mean, it's great, great fun to study, but it's also all sub-cycle, and therefore this is, this is out of second dynamic. We simply have to find a way to harness this. So let me show you an example of what you can do with these strong fields. Uh, here's a, a very simple system we've already seen. Okay, thanks. We've already seen here the water molecule. The water molecule can be tunnel ionized twice with two pulses that are separated by a variable time delay. And if you do that and take a look at the momentum of the charge fragments that come away from the water molecule, you can trace out all of the paths by which a strong field water molecule dissociates and relate those to, use those to benchmark calculations now that are trying to keep up with the coupled electron and nuclear dynamics as the electron Coulomb explodes. And this has been, I, 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 won't, I won't go into great detail about any of this stuff, but just to show you, it's sort of a sprinkling of the ideas, how this can happen. Now, the other thing that we can do with this, same technology is create isolated out of second pulses. The isolated pulses are causing a, another big stir in Stockholm next week. The Nobel Prize was given for that to Anne Louillier, Pierre Agostini, some of some of the of the of the uh, some of some of the captions aren't showing up, so I have to tell you their names. An Louillier, Pierre Agostini, Ferenc Krauss, who discovered that this exact same process that I just showed you actually also creates light from recombination, and that light can be isolated and it can be measured, and you can use it for metrology. So you can get real subcycle on the order of 100 attosecond pulses from this, and use it for metrology. Now this this shows. Where, uh, you know, this is a very busy plot, but all of the stuff in the lower left-hand side are groups that have done this and have benchmarked how bright an attosecond laser beam they can make. And uh, on the upper right, those red dots that are much stronger is what if we did the same thing with a free electron laser? So we've succeeded in doing that in the last few years. I have to say uh, Ago Marinelli and James Cryan are the geniuses who've figured out all of the problems. One of the problems is metrology. How do you measure that you made an out of second pulse? How do you measure a process that has out of second uh, uh, time structure? They do this by using the same trick. You, your out of second pulse does something, and then a strong laser field moves that electron around, and you can use that to make a street camera, and you can use that to measure out of second processes. We've used it. This, again, is the work of Karen Driver and C.G. Lee. We've used it to measure the Auger decay of an X-ray ionized uh, molecule. This is the NO molecule. This was resonantly excited and then, uh, and then Auger decayed and seen interference between the different electronic states that are involved in that. Not possible to see in any other way. Um, here are the states. I'm going to skip over that. And we've even made these pump probe pulse, uh, pulse pairs now of X-ray pulses. And I'll just end with that. We're now just entering the regime where we can actually make molecular movies without a second time. So that's not a small group doing it. But I want to get to my final point here, which is that this is only possible because of the handshaking between science and technology. The scientists push the technologist to do something new. That was what happened in Donna's case. The technologist then do that new thing, and the scientists discover that the world is, is yet still richer. That's going to continue, and I think quantum computing can play an important role in chemistry in this, because we are now at this place where we can now make measurements of all of these things that cannot be calculated easily with uh, ordinary techniques because of coupled electron and nuclear motion. And it's been mentioned several times that that's a challenge that might be a near-term challenge for quantum computing.